Well, hello everyone. This is Mike Howard and I am here with Beverly Howard. You can tell we're at a different venue today. <laughs> uh, we're in our, on our annual uh, get together with family in Mexico. We've been coming to the same place for about 20 plus years and it's a great time to get to be with everybody in the family. That would be our two sons and their families. So uh, welcome to Mexico and uh, <laughs> let's get started with the lesson. We're in chapter 28 of the book Genesis and today Jacob is going to have a dream. As you can tell by the slide, he's going to see a stairway to heaven. So let's get started. Well, a lot has happened in the last 12 chapters, was actually 16 chapters of the book of Genesis. So let me do a really quick review. God, number one, in chapter 12, 15, and 17, God speaks to Abraham and gives him an amazing covenant relationship agreement. And he makes it uh, for both Abraham and his descendants, his seed. And then Isaac is later born to Abraham and Sarah when Abraham's 100 and Sarah is 90. He is the long promised child from God. And so Isaac then grows up and he becomes uh, a teenager. And then God tells Abraham to sacrifice Isaac and Abraham is obedient. And, but before he can, God provides a substitute. Remember that lesson. Isaac grows up, he's a little bit over 40. Uh, Abraham sends back to Haran, his uh, previous location, for a bride. And so he sends a servant, servant brings back a young girl named Rebecca. So Rebecca and Isaac are married. And then fast forward a few years and Esau and Jacob are twins. Esau is born first, but while they're still inside of Rebecca, uh, they're having a conflict. And so Rebecca asked God, what in the world's going on? They're God's, at war. Yeah, they're at war. And God says, uh, the younger will actually, uh, the older will actually serve the younger. So that was the message to Rebecca, who I'm sure explained it to Isaac, that, that the second born, which was Jacob, was going to actually be the receiver of Abraham's covenant. So, however, uh, so, uh, Isaac decides that because he likes Esau best, he's going to try to pull one over on everybody and give the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant to Esau. But uh, Rebecca overhears that he's going to do that. And she, he and she and Jacob cook up a deceptive scheme to fool Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob. So he does. Well, that makes Esau extremely angry. So because Esau is going to kill Jacob, mm. it's now time for uh, Jacob to leave town uh, until Esau cools off. So that's mm -hmm. the background for that. Now we're up in chapter 28 and Jacob is about to leave to go back to the same place that Rebecca is from to look for his bride. So this is a chapter that tells that story. Isaac blesses Jacob. He calls him in uh, before he sends him off and he blesses him. He, he gives him, of course, a, a repeat of Abraham's covenant and he sends Jacob to his uncle Laban's house, that would be Rebekah's brother, to search for a bride, that would be a cousin. So Jacob has a dream, he stops uh, and rests for the night and has a dream where he sees, uh, has a vision of a ladder, and that word uh, can mean ladder, staircase, gateway. Uh, it's reminiscent of the uh, Tower of Babel, same kind of image that you get to that, that, that goes from earth all the way up to heaven. And then God speaks, once he shows uh, uh, Jacob this ladder, this staircase, uh, God then speaks to Jacob and gives him uh, the Abraham covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, and a lot of promises. So uh, Jacob then, once he wakes up, is like, wow, this is amazing. So he renamed the place the house of God, or in Hebrew, Bethel. So that's kind of the background. So there are three focal points or three things that I'd like to focus on in this lesson. The first is the dream itself, the latter. Uh, the second, God's promises when he speaks to Jacob. And the third is Jacob's response to God. So those are the three points I'm gonna focus on. But let's read the story. I'm gonna start in verse one because that's when uh, Isaac actually blesses Jacob and gives him uh, the covenant. So. 
Uh, Isaac tells Jacob, go get a bride, but don't get a Canaanite bride like your brother Esau. So Isaac called for Jacob and he blessed him. Then he commanded him, do not marry a Canaanite woman. I want you to go back to Haran. Go at once to Padan Aram to the house of your mother's father, Bethuel. Take your wife, take a wife for yourself there from among the daughters of Laban, who is your mother's brother. In other words, one of your cousins. And then uh, Isaac says a pretty cool thing. He says, may God Almighty, and of course we remember that from uh, uh, lessons in the past, God Almighty uh, is a translation of El Shaddai. Most of the translations translate that name as God Almighty. But if you take a look at where El Shaddai is used, especially in Genesis, it actually refers to the God of new life, okay, or the God of fruitfulness. And look how he follows it up. He said, may the God of new life bless you, make you fruitful, and increase your numbers until you become a whole community or a nation of peoples. And that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Now, he finishes it up by saying this, and he, he kind of does a rerun of Abraham's covenant. He says, may he give you and your descendants the blessings that he gave to Abraham, my father, your grandfather, so that you may take, number one, possession of the land where you now reside as a foreigner, the land that God gave to Abraham. And so then Jacob is gonna start his journey. Then Isaac sent Jacob on his way and he went to Padan Aram uh, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, who was the mother of Jacob and Esau. So Jacob left Beersheba, so he's on a journey. I'll show you the map in just a second and he sits, sets out for Haran. And when Jacob reaches a certain place, in other words, at the end of the day of travel, he stopped for the night because the sun had set and taking one of the stones there that where he was had stopped, he put the stone under his head to lay down to sleep. Now, I've had some hard pillows in my life, but I bet you that was not a comfortable mm -hmm. way to sleep. It beats putting your head on the ground, I guess. Anyway, this is the map. If you can see down here, Beersheba is where uh, Isaac and uh, Jacob were and, and Rebekah lived. And then he's on his way to here to Haran and he stops the first night in Beth Bethel. Oh, actually, Bethel. he renames it Bethel. Uh, it was named Luz. Hmm. All right. Uh, Jacob's dream. So now he's laid down with his head on a rock and he launches into a dream. And this is the first part of the of first point I want to make in the lesson. He said, he had a dream in which he saw a stairway and the bottom of the stairway rested on the earth with the top reaching all the way up to heaven. Remind you of, of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11 with the Tower of Babel, doesn't it? And then the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Now, the word angel means messenger. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you think of the word evangelist, it's Eve angel. Is, okay, so God's message of good news. And that's what that's cool. the angel word means here is a, a messenger, God's messenger. So when God wants to message from heaven to earth, he's going to use this. This is important. When God is going to speak from heaven to earth, he's going to speak using this ladder or this gateway. This is the means for the angels or the messengers to come from heaven to earth. This is important for later in the lesson. Okay, they were ascending, in other words, they were carrying the messages of God back and forth. Now, that's what they were doing, and sure enough, God has a message for Jacob. So he sees the staircase, he sees the messengers, and now he's going to get the message. There above it stood the Lord. God was standing in the heavens, of course. And he says this to Jacob, I am, that's his name that he gave to Moses, I am the Lord the God of your father, Abraham, and the God, uh, well, actually, it's your grandfather, Abraham, and the God of your father, Isaac. I will, and you won't, but I will, I will give you and your descendants the land upon which you are lying. Okay, so where you're taking a nap here, <laughs> sleeping through the night, that's part of the land I'm going to give you as my promise to you. This is part of the Abrahamic promise, this is the land. And then the next thing he says is, your descendants, so now he's going to talk about the blessing. So the first part was the land. The second part is the blessing. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. Remember he said that to Abraham, dust of the earth, stars in the sky. And uh, and you will spread out to the west, into the east, into the north, into the south. And then he talks about the blessing, not only that he's going to give to Jacob, but the blessing that Jacob and his descendants are going to be to the world. He says all the peoples, just same thing he said to Abraham, on earth are going to be blessed through you and your descendants. 
The third part, though, I think personally is the best part of the message, the angel message to Jacob, and that is not just the land and not just the blessings, but the presence. Mm -hmm. I am, he says, verse 15, with you. I will watch over you wherever you go. That's future. I will, future, bring you back to this land, and I will not leave you until I have done everything that I have promised you that I would do. That's God's mm. commitment. And we know that how faithful God is. What? Mm. The land, that's great. Thank you very much. The descendants, awesome. Glad to hear it. In fact, I'm going to be a blessing. Good news to me. Best news ever was what you finished with, and that is you're never going to leave me. I'm going to be in your presence, on your mind, all the time. You remember what he said to Abraham? He said, I am your very great reward. reward. And, yes. they, and that, of all this covenant blessings and promises, my opinion is that's the one. Mm. That gets me. So now that's the second part. First part was the latter dream. The second part was the message from God. The third part is going to be how does Jacob respond to this encounter that he just had with Almighty God. Verse 16, when Jacob woke up from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I just didn't have a clue. I wasn't aware of it. And then Jacob was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place? Ha! This is none other than the house of God. This is the, this is the gate. This is the gate of heaven. If you're a science fiction fan, you've seen these science fiction movies where there's a portal from one dimension to another, from one location to another. Well, that's kind of how Jacob was feeling. He was looking at this ladder and he was seeing this, this, this path, this gate, this connection between earth and heaven where God lives. And it was just, it was, he had completely been blown away. But look at the next part of his response. Early the next morning, after he wakes up, Jacob takes the stone that he placed his, under his head, sets it up as a pillar, and pours oil on top of it to consecrate it. Because, after all, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Everything that happened there, he believes that God lives in that place, on that mountain. That's the home of God. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. <clears throat> now, God had a message to Jacob that was a beautiful, beautiful message, especially the part about, the, my opinion, the presence of it, okay? Jacob is going to give a message back to God, his response back to God about what he heard from God. And you kind of, I kind of compare this to exchanging vows uh, in, in a wedding, okay? So God has kind of taken uh, the role of, let's say, the, the groom and He's given these beautiful, beautiful promises to this Jacob bride. Okay, now it's Jacob's turn to return the the vows. So here's Jacob's version of his commitment to God. Then Jacob made a vow saying, <clears throat> if God will be with me, and if God will watch over me on this journey that I'm taking, and if God will give me food to eat and clothes to wear. So two things I see here, he's got a lot of ifs mm -hmm. and he's got a lot of me's and I's, okay? But then he goes on, if, 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 so that if I do eventually return safely to my father's household, then, okay, this is, these are his vows. <laughs> if then. It's an if then, okay? Mm -hmm. Then the Lord, okay, fine. If he does all these things, okay. then, okay, fine. Then the Lord will be my God. And oh, by the way, just to make sure that you know how serious I am, this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, God, I'll, I'll give you back 10%. Hey, that's pretty generous, right? I mean, you do all that stuff for me, then I'll make you my God. And then I'll, I'll give you 10%. Just, just for, for being a good God, I'll give you a tip. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure doing business with you. 
Now, I don't think God rolls his eyes, um, but if it was me, I would have said, I just gave you one of the most beautiful promises that you could get from a God who is completely faithful and your response is an if then and a tip. Uh, mm, I, you know, sometimes I think if, if I had been part of that, I would have said to God, perhaps Esau was the right guy. Maybe you picked the wrong person. And sometimes in my life, when I see some of the things that I do with God, I think, oh, boy, that was pretty immature. For all the things that God has done for you, that was a pretty weak response or weak commitment. Mm -hmm. Let me just summarize and then instead of doing a application, I'm gonna change it a little bit and talk about the meaning of all of what we've talked about. So let's do a quick summary. With his father's blessing, Jacob leaves the promised land in search of his bride. And you, some commentaries turn this into a shadow of God sending Jesus to earth uh, to look for his church. Uh, I don't know if that's right, but it is the story that we read today. And then while he's on the journey, Jacob then has an encounter with God, a personal encounter in a dream. Now, Jacob grew up in a, in a family that talked about God a lot. Abraham, his grandfather, I'm sure was at many meals along with his dad and uh, sure Rebecca and they all told all these wonderful stories about all the things that God had said to them and done for them. So also in this story, God, uh, Jacob is going to have an encounter and personal encounter with God and where God is gonna confirm personally to Jacob the Abrahamic covenant that Isaac conferred already on Jacob. He says, it's, you're gonna get the land, you're gonna get a great name, you're gonna have lots of descendants, you're gonna have a blessing and then you're gonna be a blessing. And then in my opinion, the best part, I am going to be your great reward. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's kind of beautiful to me about Jacob's response is it's a start. He wakes up, he's afraid, he's amazed, but he begins to make changes in his life. He sets up a stone, mm -hmm. he renames the city, and he makes what I think is a fairly silly and immature commitment, but at least he got a start. It's a start. It's not much, but he got started. And it's here when you read this story and then you look forward to the rest of Jacob's life that you see that none of this was really about Jacob. It was all about God in Jacob, working in his life. And you know, that's the story of our lives. Mm -hmm. It's not about me, not about Beverly, it's not about any of us. It's about God working in us. So in that perspective, this is our story. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a little bit about the meaning. I'm gonna break it into all three points, the latter dream, God's promises and our response. So the latter dream, it's a flashback. It's the fulfillment in a dream of chapter 11 where man attempted to build a ladder to reach heaven and God looked down so they could build a name for themselves. And God looked down and said, no, so he confused their language so that they would finally disperse and fill the world. And then God proclaims that he will provide that connection, that, that tower, that gateway, that staircase, that portal himself. Man's not going to build it. Man couldn't build it. Man can't do that. God, only God can do that. And many Old Testament, so I'm going to make a note here, many of the things that we see in stories like this in the Old Testament are shadows of Christ. Like, and like circumcision, they sometimes are external and physical, but they're actually pointing us to internal and spiritual truth. Circumcision is not of the body, it's circumcision of the heart. the heart. It's an inside job, okay? So let's talk about the meaning of the latter. The Gospel of John then is where we have to go to find really good descriptions of a lot of these things and what they mean in Christ. So John focuses on explaining many of these shadows and he sometimes, most of the times, he, he pairs the shadow with a miracle that Jesus does where Jesus then proclaims that he is that thing in a person. And so there are seven I am statements that are pretty famous in the Gospel of John. You remember he is, he says he is the bread of heaven, meaning when you had the manna, that was really a shadow of Christ. 
that he is the resurrection and the life. He is the good shepherd. He is the light of the world. Remember, he's standing there with all the candelabra in the temple, and he, say, he proclaims, these candelabra are not the light of the world. I am the light of the world. So the things are actually pointing to the person of Christ. But then of the seven things, there are three that are a little different. And one of them says, I am the way. I am the vine that connects you to God. I am the door. I am the gateway. Mm -hmm. Remember the ark where he was the door there that was sealed up. Mm -hmm. So of the seven, three of them speak to him being the way to God. He says, I am the only way to God. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no other way other than me to a connection with the Father. He is actually the latter. There's a story in John chapter 1, verse 51, is the verse I've got here. But the story is uh, God meets, uh, now I can't think of his name, but uh, Nathaniel and uh, his brother. And uh, his brother goes to tell Nathaniel about uh, Jesus. And Nathaniel says, are you serious? The Messiah is from this, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, Nazareth? Nothing good comes from Nazareth. So when he finally gets dragged in front of Jesus, Jesus says, here's an Israelite that's a true Israelite. And, and uh, he says back to Jesus, well, how do you know me? And Jesus said, well, I, I saw you while you were still sitting under the fig tree. And with that confession, that, uh, with that statement, Nathaniel says, you must be, you are the, the son of God. You are the Messiah. And Jesus, Jesus says, if that was sufficient, if that's all you needed to come to that conclusion, then get ready, fasten your seatbelt. Being my disciple, you're going to see a lot more than that. And this is the thing that he said back to Nathaniel. Very truly, I tell you, Nathaniel, you are going to see heaven open and you're going to see the angels of God ascending and descending on me. Mm. Jesus is the ladder. He is not just a physical ladder, a physical gateway. He is the person, the only person who can connect earth with heaven. And the angels, that means the message. Mm. And the message is the good news. Mm. So he's the ladder upon which the good news of God comes to earth. That's the latter dream. Let's talk about God's promises. Man said, let us build a gateway to God. God said, no, you're not going to do it. I will. And God then promises everything to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then it all comes true in Jesus. And he says, God's promises depend on the goodness and the faithfulness of God, not, not on anything about man, you can't depend on man. And I just go back and look at this, verse 15, I am with you, I will watch over you wherever you go, I will bring you back to this land, I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised in you. In other words, um, he who has begun a good work will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So God's promises are amazing. But let's take a look at what our response to God's promises are. Now, Jacob uh, knew a lot about God from Abraham and Isaac and Rebekah, his mom. Uh, but in the grand scheme of what we as Christians know, because we've got the Bible, it was just a small little speck of information about who God was. Remember Moses, God told Moses, that, you know, they only knew me partially, but I am who I am. That's the whole mm. name. So let's talk about our response because our response is like Jacob's response. It's indicative of our journey of faith. I'm going to talk about baby through to mature. A baby response, which is most, if not all Christians that I've ever spoken with, they are somewhere in this area and I have been myself. If God will do these things, then I will fill in the blank. Hmm. That's what Jacob says. It's a lot of Christians say it. We mm. should know better than that, but that's kind of how we feel about God. He's a 
He's a giant vending machine. Oh, God, please do this. Please do that. And if you don't, then, you know, it's going to shatter my faith. Mm. But the more mature we get, the closer we get to this, and that is I submit myself to you because you said you never leave me. And then all your promises, according to 1 Corinthians chapter mm. 1, verse 20, all your promises, every promise that you made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, through Jesus, all of those promises are true for us. They're yes for us mm. in Christ Jesus. Mm. That's amazing. And then you, God, have promised that you're you're not going to stop working on me the way you didn't stop working on Jacob until the work in me is complete. And that's mm. Philippians 1, 6. So I want to finish with two things, two thoughts. One is it's personal. Uh, now, what do I mean by that? Well, Jacob, like many of us, many of those of you, uh, grew up in a godly household, and he was told a lot about God. But Jacob's faith journey didn't really begin until he had a personal encounter with God. Now, I remember my first personal encounter with God, and that's where my faith journey began. And I know if I could hear from you, you would tell me about your personal encounter with God. If you're a Christian, you've had a personal encounter with God. And that's where the journey begins. It's progressive. It goes from stupid, silly, immature baby things to mature things. Jacob starts out with an immature statement of faith. But over his life, God grew Jacob's faith as he wrestled, literally, with God's will. And at the end of his life, in Genesis 48... Jacob makes this confession to his sons. My God has been my shepherd all of my days. When my father passed away a few years ago, at 93, we would sit and talk. And I watched him struggle with his faith off and on but it got stronger and stronger, like Jacob. And the last conversations I had with dad, he would say to me, the Lord has been good to me all of my life. Mm -hmm. So the question I've got for you is, have you made the confessions that need to be made? Do you make the confession that this ladder, this gate, this portal from earth to heaven, this Jesus will bring you back. He is the way back to a relationship with God. That his life, his death, his resurrection is your gate, your ladder, your door. And then have you confessed that his promises and most importantly, his presence will be your shepherd all your days. Now, if you can, if you have made that confession, if you haven't, I encourage you to do it. But if you have, then guess what? Like Jacob, you can start living the dream. Pray with me. Mm. Father, what a beautiful story. Mm. Jacob is such a ditz. <laughs> he reminds me so much of myself. Mm. Father, you grew him into a giant of faith. Mm -hmm. You based the nation Israel upon him. Mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you would continue to build us into the image of Christ. What you've started, you will be faithful mm -hmm. to finish. Reclaiming all of these promises mm -hmm. in Christ Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Mm -hmm. Well, it was a great lesson for me. Oh, I hope it yes. was for you. Uh, the weather here is great. I hope it's fine where you are. Stay well. Know that we love you guys. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.